Welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I am your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today I'm joined by Mr. Tommy Robertson, who is the owner of Fibes Drums and Tommy's Drum Shop in Austin, Texas. Tommy, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Glad to be here. Yeah, we've been talking for a long time um, about getting you on, and and uh, that's just the way it goes with a lot of these. I mean, well over a year. And uh, before I forget, I want to say thank you to Mr. Eric Hughes, um, who a lot of people know for his involvement with uh, PAS, the Percussive Art Society. So um, thank you to Eric for kind of letting me know about you and your involvement with Fibes. Yeah, yeah. He's a great guy. Really good. So... Um, it's really neat to talk to someone who who owns this, you know, heritage, like just everyone likes Fives. I think Fives is kind of has a something about it. It's legendary. Um, so before we get to how you acquired this brand, which I think is great because you're keeping it alive. What is the origins of Fives drums? Well, basically, uh, Bob Grasso. A very talented player, by the way, um, and John Marina, they cross paths, and Bobby being a professional player in New York, he uh, was uh, Connie Francis' uh, musical director for years, played Vegas all over the country, a lot of New York, uh, and so forth, and uh, he crossed paths with a man named John Marina. Well, John, also a drummer. But he was a specialist in composite materials and molding and so forth. So they kind of struck up this conversation. And uh, over the course of time, they decided that they would try to formulate uh, something different in the drum industry from what was already out there. All the classic brands were all aware of. And so they started prototyping. Uh, different shell formulations and so forth uh, using John's expertise and Bobby's input as a player. And so the, the end result was around 1965, late 1965, they, uh, they started what essentially was Fives Drum Company. The original branding was actually, and there's a prototype drum, actually know the person that has it, uh, they were going to originally go with G&M hmm. for Grasso and Marina, which they subsequently didn't do, obviously. But uh, uh, Bobby knew somebody, uh, a friend of his, and he was talking to this gentleman about what he was doing. And this guy comes up and says, yeah, man, that should be fives. Bobby's going, what are you talking about? He says, were you talking fiberglass shells? And sound vibrations. Mm. And that's where this whole thing came from was kind of the marriage of those two words. And that's where the, the origin of fibes come from. Fiberglass and sound vibrations. Yeah, it's, it fits it perfectly. and um, It does. It would does. So it took somebody who was actually not affiliated, just a friend. And just by happenstance, that's how it happened. Yeah, sometimes I think with these brands and these stories... You need that outside perspective because people are so close to it where some guy just comes up and goes, it should be fives, man. <laughs> yeah. And that's kind of what happened. He says fives, man. It's, it's, it, there should be fives. Yeah. He's going, it's like a light bulb went off. Right. So he's going, yeah, that's great. That's great. Thank you so much, <laughs> mm, man. What a cool yeah. like marriage though, of two people, uh, of their, their skills though, with Bob Grasso and John Marina. So do you know, this is kind of a, you know specific question but do you know what john marina was doing before to ha have this knowledge of composite materials was he like working on you know boats or building <laughs> corvettes you know what i mean there's fiberglass well, yeah, is pretty specific you know it's it's funny you should say that and actually i just uh purchased a book i i spoke to john only once uh this was back in the early day my early days of reforming the company and I talked to him briefly, so I didn't know John very well at all, but he was an author of a book about composite materials and molding and so forth. Mm -hmm. So it's something he's been involved in for years. And, and uh, now how he and Bobby linked up, uh, I'm not exactly sure on that. Um, you know, but Bobby was a player on the scene, and I think John was maybe out, I'm just speculating here, 
uh, you know, heard Bobby play or saw him at a club or something, and they struck up a conversation, and and then it, it went on from there. Hmm. But uh, so I'm not sure what John had going on prior to that. Uh, uh, Bobby never heard John play, according to him, so he wasn't sure how good or bad of a drummer he actually was. Um, yeah. Uh, Bobby himself was a very talented player, and uh, he would come to shows for us. But anyway, uh, that's that's kind of how they just got together and then decided on the name, and then that was around late 1965, and then uh, they had some prototypes, and um, a lot of that stuff Bobby would use, for example, Roger's parts and things uh, that he liked to assemble and make some of these prototypes with. What was the original prototype um, for the Fives drums? Because Fives is both known as, um, you know, makers of really cool acrylic drums, as we all know. Um, right. But also, right. I think of Fives with having like kind of like a chrome look to them sometimes where it's uh, fiberglass. Well, what they started with was the fiberglass. And and uh, so they had the uh, the snare drum and all the toms. Of course, everything was traditional sized at that time. And, uh, but fiberglass was the, was the genesis of the whole deal. And, uh, the, the crystallite as it became known, mm -hmm. the acrylic shells, uh, and if you notice that name crystallite, uh, Ludwig shortly thereafter came out with Vistalite mm. and, and so forth. And, and that's where that came from for them. But, uh, that, that came a few years later on. But in the original fives, it was really, it was really primarily focused was on fiberglass drums. Would they do um, a variety of, you know, different wraps and different finishes on these fiberglass drums? I, I can't really think of that. I've seen too many of the early 60s fives. I know I've seen a ton of like, um, like on drumarchive.com, like uh, catalogs. But what would be the finishes and uh, the, the look that they would typically have on those early ones? Well, uh, a lot of uh, the early stuff, you mentioned chrome, and that was actually a metal sheeting. It was actually, there's chrome or brushed copper and a few other colors that they had. There were actually metal sheeting with a finish on it. Mm. And uh, uh, brushed copper and chrome were two, two of the most popular ones. They also did, which I came to find out, they would do black and white which actually was a vertical formica because a vertical formica as opposed to regular laminate, it's a lot thinner and a lot more flexible. So you could actually use it as a drum covering, extremely tough, extremely durable. Uh, uh, so they had that and they, they did uh, uh, butcher block, for example, mm -hmm. and some other colors, the agate. And so they had, they had quite a few different colors but what I found is is the uh, on the fiberglass with the chrome or the brushed copper and other metal coverings made the drums very heavy. Yeah, <laughs> they weighed yeah. a lot. They sounded great, very loud, but man, they were heavy drums with that metal covering on it. Yeah, I wonder if there were issues with it, the covering kind of peeling off because I imagine you have to use some serious adhesive to get that well on. they were using a, 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 a contact cement and okay. there are issues with that from what I can tell from early because I've seen quite a few of the early ones now and I really haven't seen any really any kind of let's say delamination or so forth but what did or does happen to them is uh, the chrome for example it starts to kind of either pit or you get rusting or you get some sort of blemishes in the finishes. Sure. And, and that's what would happen slowly over time if they weren't wiped down or taken care of or something got spilled on it and so forth. It's really, uh, you know, this happens a lot, but I, I like the other day, I mean, two days ago, three days ago, I got a message from a guy named Peter Douglas who actually just sent me a message about, Hey, I think a cool episode uh, topic could be about, chrome and chrome drums and he, he's talking about how uh it used to be really 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 common with a lot of um i guess you could just say industries but now the drum world is one of the you know i'm sure cars motorcycles that uses a lot of chrome but uh he was talking about how you know musical instruments particularly drums it's still very common you know chrome over brass and chrome this and that 
Um, right. right. Where a lot of the Chrome though has has not been as common in uh, other industries. Which so I'm kind of working on a Chrome episode here in the back of my mind for later, but um, <laughs> it all it all dovetails, yeah. you know. <clears throat> yeah, and and uh, you know the whole Chrome thing. Of course, Slingerland did Chrome, and Ludwig had Chrome over wood. I mean, yeah. So there's there's a lot of that going on, you know, and and uh, I, I don't think there's as much happening now, current speak, no. as there used to be, just because it's it's expensive and it's not as you know. I mean, in the long run, it it doesn't hold up well, <laughs> unfortunately. You know, unless yeah. you polish it and you keep it clean, you know, things are going to happen. It's gonna it's gonna start to get blemished. Yeah, and and I I have to say he noted that uh, he said quote him saying we Premiere fans think that Premiere made the best uh, Chrome in history and I, there's a whole bunch of stories with that and Chrome and the company who made did the same company make Rolls Royce Chrome you know and all that stuff so well I, you know I have to agree with them on that I've I've seen Premiere you know back in the day when they were doing a lot of stuff in house including plating. Their chrome was absolutely positively gorgeous. I mean, you couldn't get any better looking chrome than what they had yeah. for that that period of time for what they were doing. I mean, it, I agree with them on that. Yeah, sure. All right, so early 60s, uh, so they started this company. I don't know if we if you said this. Where exactly is, where are we geographically for the founding mm-hmm. of the company? It was in Farmingdale, New York. Okay. Um, and that's where it started was in Farmingdale, New York. And uh, uh, matter of fact, a few years ago, I brought up, uh, brought up on Google Maps uh, and actually saw, I think, what was the original building. It's something like 22 Murray Street or something. I've, I've got it in one of my documentation. But just out of curiosity, but that's where they started up. And they were there for about approximately five years. Hmm. Okay. And, uh, and they started producing... The drums out of that facility, and and uh, and Bobby was constantly playing. I mean, he's telling me, you know, he would he would be in and out. He'd be <laughs> Jerry said he he stopped by the factory or whatever, and he's in tux because he's about to go out and do a show, <laughs> whether it's with Connie Francis or whatever he was doing at that time. Yeah, a very active player, and so um, so he would he would come in and out of the factory just to kind of see what was going on and so forth. I think John was there more often, being more of a hands-on guy. And of course, they had they had a staff that was was working and building the shells and doing the lamination and so forth. Mm. Pretty cool that he is such a uh, a, a true working drummer, as they say, because oh, yes. you don't have to be a professional drummer to own a drum manufacturing, you know, business right. to work at a drum factory. Any of these things, you. You just, you know, you kind of take that for granted. People think sometimes that people in these companies are actually drummers, but you don't have to be. You can just be a business minded person who knows the industry. But I think maybe right. that played obviously to his benefit to to be a real deal guy out there in the field who can test it and know what he's know, know what he likes. Yeah, and I think that was I agree. That was part of the passion of the deal because he was he was heavily involved in it from a sonic standpoint and 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 so was John. I mean, they both they had this this kind of thing going on where he was the player. He would check it out. He's playing it at night, for gosh sakes. And 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 so they would tweak as they went along and make fine line improvements and so forth. Yeah. So um, five years, first five years, you said they were in in New, upstate New York, like that. What right. um, what was the reception um, publicly? Did people kind of quickly just say these drums are great and fall in love with them or how, how was the reception? You know, that's, that's a really good question. I think they sold a fair amount of drums in that time period, but you got to remember they were going up against the big boys. Yeah. So here they were kind of the uh, bastard child as it were, uh, you know, and, and being a totally different animal being fiberglass and so forth. And, and I think they had some moderate success, uh, but, you know, I think it's manufacturing is difficult in itself. And then to try to jump in the game where you have very well established, high profile brand name companies, Mm -hmm. that's a tough call. That's a tough thing to do. Yeah, it really But I I think they were making some pretty decent inroads in the market because they were unique. They looked great. They sounded incredible. And, and so, 
it's kind of one of those things. I think it was more kind of a grassroots kind of <laughs> yeah. uh, 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 interest that kind of uh, went on from there. Yeah, and um, I should probably know this, but what other companies, because when I think of fiberglass, early fiberglass, I think of, you know, Pearl obviously has a wood fiberglass kit, uh, which is obviously a Japanese company. Who else would have been doing fiberglass that early in 1965 when they started? Um, was there anyone else doing fiberglass drums? Well, I, I, not full sets, but if I understand correctly, and I'm not 100% on this, I think they may have gotten their hands on a Blamar shell. Okay, uh, sure. Uh, uh, because Blamar... Uh, Going back quite a bit, he had he was making he was making some snare drum shells and so forth, and I think that maybe one of the things where kind of a light bulb went off. And they said, "Wow, we need to make full sets of this, and mm. we need to we need to take this and and run with it." Gotcha. And and so uh, that's that's my understanding of it. Now, now whether that's exactly true or not, I can't honestly tell you. But that's but he did mention Blamar, he being Bob Grasso, to me, and how they had they had run across a snare drum or shell and and mocked it up and they they liked they liked the characteristics of what it was sounding and playing like gotcha okay well i'll find out about that soon actually because i've I'm, I'm been talking um with the jenkins martin guys about doing an episode about blameire and they're extensively doing research um to try and really fill out the episode and uh, i met him at the uh, Music City Drum Show last weekend, and they gave me a Blameyer T-shirt. So, uh. oh, okay, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Why well, is funny? You know, I've got a store, as you know, and I used to order coverings and stuff from Blameyer and and talk to him and everything else. I bought in some fiberglass shells actually for somebody once many years ago. Um, but I, I kind of think that's kind of where kind of maybe the nucleus of that started. Got it, got it. And those were like spun fiberglass yes, is what they're yes. known for which are just, which which is know. is similar to what fives does on the snare drum but the toms floor toms and bass drums are laid up differently gotcha which maybe we can talk about the construction here in a minute but um so you said they were five years there and, it, and from what i can tell um looking at drumarchive.com where there's obviously i always talk about it there's a bunch of great um catalogs one of the first catalogs they have is in uh 1970 where there is a pretty serious roster of drummers already yes. at that point. They had some some big yes. names. Um, yes. Pretty yes. So so it had to, you know, the the word spread. Um where did, so so first off, where did they move in 1970? Well, that's that was the CF Martin acquisition. And kind of backpedal a little bit, one of one of the key players was Alan Dawson. Mm -hmm. Okay, because Alan uh, obviously at Berkey, Berkeley and the master, <laughs> the player that he was, he and Bobby were good friends because uh, Bobby was a great player himself. And and so they knew one each other uh, personally and professionally. And so I think that from that point, you know, getting, you know, whether it's, you know, Billy Cobb came on or Grady Tate and uh, Arthur Press, there was a bunch of different players that early players that, uh, really came on board, you know, eventually Bobby Columbia, Blood, Sweat, and Tears. And and so yeah, I think it's one of those things where, you know, you've got the credibility. If you've got a player of that caliber, like a uh, Alan Dawson, for example, um, that gives you some some pretty good credibility right there. Yeah. Yeah, obviously. And Billy Cobham. I kind of, yes. I frequently think of, uh, there's just, there's great videos of him playing this just monster huge um, vibes kit, which that's well, one of my favorite things is funny you say that, and I'm sure you've heard or seen it, the Spectrum album, mm -hmm. Billy Cobham in the old album. You open up that album jacket, and there's Billy looking badass behind a double bass vibes crystallite set. Yeah, and that was that was you know he was using that in the Mahavishnu days, and uh, um, I mean. That was just, that's just part of that history. Yeah. Well, all right. So let's kind of like, there's so many different things. Let's pause there for a second and maybe talk about the crystallite stuff a little bit because it's, you know, I, I've heard it in other episodes. I did one on the history of acrylic drums and then one on the history of uh, Zico drums as well. Right. It's pretty, I think it's a pretty big deal that, that crystallite, you know, was fives. And then like you said, soon after 
Ludwig thought that was such a great name and idea that they did Vistalite. Did right. you did you hear any stories about you know Fives being like, uh, hey, <laughs> that's pretty <laughs> pretty similar to our name. Well, yeah, yeah. Um, there's a kind of a lot of that I heard over the years through Bobby and other people. Um, uh, uh, you know about people kind of maybe kind of stretching things around a little bit. I mean, even current speak Pearl, their acrylic shell drums are called crystal beat. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's like everybody kind of puts their own spin on it, but you know, I just have to laugh because you mentioned Zikos and then fives. I mean, they're basically came out with the acrylic thing and, and I really haven't ever gotten a total clear picture on that. I don't know who was actually literally first, but from what I can tell, it almost happened pretty close to simultaneously. Yeah, that's uh, so common. When when I had uh, Wes Falconer from uh, yeah, Explorers. Explorers on, and yes, he, he, uh-huh. he's obviously in that Zikos kind of neighborhood over there. Um, he was... He he was he said you know that it would be uh, Bill Zikos, but I could definitely see. I don't. I think that happens in the world where if if multiple people can doing be doing things simultaneously. Um, yes, yes. And That's right. uh, but now Fibes has um, not all of them are like this, but they've got something unique that has sort of that frosted look to it. Yeah, <laughs> that's right, and that's what's called frosted, kind of the uh, shower door look, let's say. Yeah, exactly. which are really cool. Yeah, um, um, and that was, I mean, let's face it, you know, was that you know, late sixties, nineteen seventy, whatever they came out with the frost. I mean, that's pretty wild stuff for that point in time, you know. Yeah, absolutely. And, do you yeah. know what they would do manufacturing wise to achieve that? Is it just kind of add like a like etch into it a little bit or how did they do that? Well, I, I don't know exactly what the process, but I think etching might be part of it or maybe putting some sort of, uh, either chemical solvent. And that may be part of the John Marina aspect on it. I honestly don't know, but, uh, 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 uh it was one of those things that they, and they may have just with the vendor that they were using at the time, getting the material from them, could have just said, hey, we've got this too. And they said, wow, let's give that a try. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, obviously, they had to cut the shell back so the head could lay on it right. Mm-hmm. So there was that there was that cut, that kind of counter cut on the outside of the shell so you could actually put a drum head on and tune it up, you know? Yeah. So, so it, had it, it had its own kind of unique uh, series of uh, 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 dynamic that you had to work around using a shell that had that kind of texture on the exterior. Yeah. Now – couple things here the lugs for fives are really cool and really unique yes. what's the story with the lugs well that was part of anita that's bob grasso's wife anita grasso and uh from my understanding she helped design what's called the diamond lug mm. that's what it's called is the sure. diamond lug which is kind of another we were talking about companies kind of taking pages from one another there's other companies out there that use that term now but I mean, that was what the concept of Fives was, was the diamond lug. And so that's something she kind of, uh, that was her brainchild and they liked it aesthetically. And so that's, that's how that developed. That's awesome. And then one other thing I want to make sure we talk about is the connection between Buddy Rich and Fives, particularly the snare drum, because it is. Okay. It yeah. is legendary. So, so yeah, what, it is. what's the story with that? Okay. Well, um, Bobby played in Vegas a lot and he became good friends with Louis Belson. And so basically Bobby's telling Louis about what he's doing with the fiberglass snare drum and so forth. And, and Louis is very, very interested. And so, um, Louis says, Hey, I want to, I want to take you to meet Buddy. And so they arrange a meeting. So Bobby meets Buddy Rich, gives him a snare drum to use, which is the, it's a five and a half by 14 SFT chrome covered fiberglass shell snare drum. And Buddy just flipped out hmm. over it. And, uh, and so he and Bobby, Buddy and Bobby became very, very good friends and hung out a lot. Matter of fact, just a little sidebar here. 
Bobby to- told me that Buddy used to call him Pans. Pans because when they were in Vegas, Bobby would cook for Buddy. Huh. You know, he'd be there, be at their hotel or whatever. He'd just he'd cook and whip something up for Buddy to eat. Wow, that's how close they were. Huh. And so Buddy just absolutely loved his SFT snare drum, and that's where that famous thing where on the uh, Rich in London on the back cover shot uh, of that picture looking across the hi hat, you distinctly see that five snare drum on his stand playing it live, um, yep. which. <laughs> from what I'm told, he was endorsing, uh, Buddy was endorsing Slingland at the time. And they were not too pleased when they found out about that. And as the story goes, and this is what I told, and sometimes you don't know how much is truth or how much is fiction. Mm-hmm. But as the story is told, Buddy was in Vegas. Uh, some of the Slingland people came to visit him in Vegas and and asked Buddy, said, What's the deal with the snare drum? You're a Slingland endorser. And Buddy says to them, can you make a snare drum that sounds like this? <laughs> and they say, well, no. He said, then what are we talking about? We're talking about Buddy Rich. You know what I mean? Yeah. So he said, any more questions? Uh. So, I mean, it's kind of, you know, it's kind of like that thing where Buddy's kind of in your face. And it's like, well, what are you going to do about it kind yeah. of thing? You know, wow. in other words, I'm Buddy Rich and you're not. So I'm going to do what I want to do. If you got a problem with it, I'll move elsewhere. It's kind of one of those deals, you know. Hmm. So they figure, hey, they still got the sling and the logo on the front bass drum head and all the toms and floor time, everything. The sling, they figure nobody except other drummers or inside people we even know any difference anyway. Hmm. Yeah. Man, that's fascinating. And so you said with the snare drum they did do that kind of spun fiberglass technique typically, or what was different about what makes a, a, a five snare yeah, it's, drum? It's a different process. Yeah. Uh, it's a different process on the, the fabrication of the snare drum, as opposed to the molding that they did for the, the toms and floor toms and bass drum and so forth. Mm-hmm. And they did that uh, because of the sonic properties. They found that the, 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 the layup, like doing it on the, the toms and floor tom, didn't really work. It didn't have the same sonic quality. It didn't have the power and projection of, of, of doing a different type of molding formula. And here again, that's, that's a tip of a hat to, uh, uh, to John Marina and his expertise in being able to formulate uh, a, a better, better molding for, for the toms and bass drum. Yeah, and not settling and just getting the right. best result yeah they they were into it man <laughs> seriously they were into it to get you know? buddy's uh approval is is pretty wild and yeah i this this is probably one of those just like things like you said where it's just a story but I've, i feel like i heard someone say once that he would take the hardware off of a slingerland snare or whoever he was endorsing and put it on his five snare so he could still use it and not be you know get in trouble but yeah. I don't know if that's just a story. Well, I, I don't I don't know if that's just a story either. But if I remember correctly, uh, from what Bobby told me, is that some of the early generation fiberglass, when the prototypes, uh, I believe he was using Rogers hardware, so like a beaver tail style lug or mm-hmm. whatever. And so that may be where that story kind of came from. And and I honestly don't know that. And but I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, if if he if he, you know, but to me, buddy, if he's wants to use the five snare drum, I can't see him or paying somebody to install lugs on a fiberglass shell with a different hole pattern. Yeah, he wouldn't. He I, wouldn't I just, care. I have a hard time. <laughs> I'm not saying it didn't happen because I don't know. Yeah, that's a good I'm point. Just, I just think with buddy, the way buddy is, it's like, hey, if you don't like it, screw you. I'll go to the next guy, you know? Mm. Yeah. Because so up front, anyway, yeah. that's just my take on that. No, that's great. Um. Did he ever play, uh, I'm sure he did, you know, here and there, but he never endorsed fives like as a drum set. Is that right? He did briefly because what had happened is buddy being buddy, he was falling in and falling out with different drum companies. He's eccentric, right? Mm -hmm. And, uh, he actually struck up a deal with Vox drums of all people. Yeah. Okay. Trixon. Well, that was a very short-lived arrangement with Vox because they were not really 
a player really in the game. So uh, uh, that after that, Bobby made him a full set, full fire, fiberglass set. I think this was somewhere around 1966, if I remember correctly, uh, um, and that he used through the remainder of the tour. And I, and I don't know the specifics of that, but he basically, when he ditched Vox, uh, he went and played fives, full set of fives for a while. But here again, that was, that was, and then I think from there, uh, but he went to Ludwig. Gotcha. And f- with a quick Google, I kind of found a, uh, drum magazine article f- through Don Bennett's website. It looks like it's, it's got a Chrome finish on it, you know, which is in the, the right style. Um, right. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Looks like it's a 24 by 14 bass drum, 13 by nine mounted Tom two 16 by 16 floor toms and classic buddy and his 14 by five and a half snare. Um, yep. That's so, classic buddy. Uh huh. Yeah. It says it has, so, yeah. Wahlberg and Auger, uh, Tom mount. Yeah. Interesting. That's right. Yeah. That's correct. Uh huh. Yeah. Cool. And, but that, that was a kind of a short lived deal as far as the full set. Yeah. You know, because sure. Bobby wasn't in a position, especially around that time, you know, they were, they were trying to make a go of it, you know, but he's, you know, was kind of a, a, a high demand kind of guy, you know, that's where he got trouble with other companies. Uh, he was constantly asking for more gear, you know, and, and, you know, they weren't in the position, they being Bobby and John at that time, they can't just sit there, you know, buddy calls from Seattle and goes, Hey, I need another kit. They're going, whoa, wait a minute, buddy. You've got one already. You know, it's yeah. one of those kind of things. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, uh, so I, I just think, you know, for buddy's standpoint, it's like, I've got to be with somebody big enough that can supply me for my needs. Sure. Which the, his needs were, were many from what it sounds like, <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yes. Yes. But, but beyond all that, he was, and, and Bobby told me, and I actually met Buddy once, and he, he was a very sweet guy. He's just had a, he had a very low threshold on BS yeah. and insincere people. And so if he, any of that came up, and, and then that's when he become the quintessential Buddy. You know what I mean? Yeah. But for his inner circle and people that he liked and respected and were down to earth and real, he was a sweetheart. Yeah, sure. That's just course. not the persona that most people would see with Buddy, you know. No, you've all and we've all heard those stories about like you know Buddy with Johnny Carson and uh, Frank Sinatra oh, yeah. and the friendship they had. Um, oh yeah, which was oh, great. Yeah. So, and then one last thing about the Buddy snare. Um, it, the listing ended, but Don Bennett had it was it's on Reverb. Buddy Rich's five and a half by fourteen SFT nineteen seventy snare drum, which has been authenticated, you can own for fourteen thousand nine hundred ninety five dollars. Oh my God! Plus one hundred fifty dollars for shipping. The shipping's a little high for me, so I'm gonna I'm gonna pass. I think <laughs> <laughs> I can't swing that extra one hundred fifty bucks. Well, if it's if it's any kind, I mean, no disrespect to Buddy, but I've got one. I've, you know, I've got a I've got a Chrome SFT five and a half fourteen that I'm sure sounds every bit as good, if yeah. not better, than what that fourteen thousand dollars. It just doesn't have the providence. You know no, what I mean? No, so exactly. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. This episode is brought to you by Dream Symbols. Dream Symbols is launching the Tasting Tour 2021. There's going to be tons of cool symbols, members of the Dream Team on site, and the recycling program will be in effect all day at these various awesome music stores around the country. August 21st, they're going to be at InStuff Music in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. September 4th, they'll be at Everything Musical in Columbus, Georgia. September 11th and 12th, they'll be at Epic Percussion in Williamsport, Pennsylvania. October 2nd, they'll be at Forks Drum Closet in Nashville. October 9th, Melody Music in Bloomington, Indiana. October 16th, Rhythm Traders in Portland, Oregon. And November 6th, they'll be at Rupp Strums in Denver, Colorado. So go out and check it out if Dream will be in your town. So when we last kind of left off on the history stuff, Fibes was, you said, in the 70s. If if there's nothing else before that, um, C.F. Martin took over. which They sold to Martin. C.F. Martin organization. Why? Why did they sell? Was it just the right time where they offered a buyout, you know, and they had an offer they couldn't refuse? I think they're having trouble, and I can relate to this from a manufacturer standpoint. It's a very difficult thing to do, and uh, I kind of developed this joke when we were producing fives. Time I said, "Well, you know, if you if you create a beast, you've got to feed it, yeah. and you've got to constantly feed it, 
and it's got to be constantly fed. In other words, if you don't keep the pipeline full and you're not producing and you're not selling, you've got serious problems. And I think for Bobby and John, I mean, they put all their heart and soul into it and they were in it for five years, you know, air hook, line and sinker. And I think they needed a little help but financially. It's one of those things like, hey, we, we've done what we can do as us. We need to bring a bigger fish in here to make this thing go to the next level. Yeah. And that's where Martin came in. Uh, unfortunately, you know, in the long term, you know, Martin's a guitar company and a very famous and incredible one. But, I mean, it's like the same old scenario, and you've heard this with other companies, you mm-hmm. know, XYZ guitar company buys out this brand drum company, where they're kind of the bastard child of the deal. Yep. And unfortunately, that's eventually what happened to Fives. And the first one of the first things that when I first met Bobby, he said, you got to change the lug. I said, what the hell are you talking about? He said, you got to take it back to the original lug. And at first, I didn't know what he was talking about. But sometime in the Martin era, they'd taken the flange, the bottom flange that goes around the whole perimeter of the diamond lug, and removed it. Hmm. And, uh, and so it seems like a subtle thing and it kind of is a subtle thing, but if you put them two side by side, or you even look at it on a, a shell of a drum, it's just a pretty dramatic difference. And so he hit me to that right out of the gate. He says, you need to go back to the original look because he wasn't happy with Martin changing that up. You know what I mean? Yeah, sure. Uh, but you know, they didn't own it anymore. Martin owned it. And so is one of those things. They only had so much pull. I mean, Bobby was basically his advisory capacity, hmm. uh, really. I mean, when it came down to it. So at that point in time, um, so so that that was kind of a little interesting tidbit that he educated yeah. me on right out of the gate. Yeah, I see it. If you if you look it up online, you can see, which I guess helps you date them. Maybe that's something that you can kind of look at and go, oh, that's Martin. Yeah. That's that which, but. Yeah, right. it, it is a kind of an extra touch to have that little bit of a flange. It seems. Oh, I mean, it makes all the difference yeah. in the world. Yeah. Yeah. So I had a new, I had a new die made to replicate that. Yes. Mm. But that's, that's kind of one of those kind of subtle things that, uh, and I'm not sure at what point in time Martin did that. Uh, cause they had, they had fries for about 10 years ballpark. Yeah. Or why uh, so. they did it. Cause it's like. Does it save that much money or? Uh, it was more of a polishing issue because okay. before you chrome plate uh, the raw part, the casting needs to be buffed and polished. Mm-hmm. So when you, uh, when you go to the cream plating stage, uh, you don't, you take out as many blemishes as you can. So the chrome lays down real flat and looks pretty. Gotcha. And Martin felt like, you know, this with that little flanger, it's just a harder piece to work. And, uh, so anyway, they, they did it for whatever reasons they have, but that's, that's, that's the impression I got in talking to Bobby about is they, you know, they're trying to make it a little bit more cost effective, let's say to, to make these parts. Yeah, that makes sense. And then, so, so Bob and John go from owners to, like you said, advisors. So yes, that had to be weird. I mean, I'm sure they weren't. You yeah, know. I, if I understand, yeah, oh yeah, exactly. Oh, it was, and and from that point, and here again, I don't know at what point. Uh, John kind of drifted out of the picture at some point in time shortly thereafter. Okay, because you know it was they were part of a corporate deal, and Bob was hanging on because you know it's like he's still a player, he's still using the drums and everything else, and trying to trying to convince Martin to do these things he wants them to do, which in some cases was falling upon deaf ears because they didn't, you know, to them, it's just a business holding. They don't, there's not the passion there for them. Yeah. For them, it's just another acquisition here. We got a product. Let's turn it out. Let's sell it. Boom. There you go. Hmm. Um, and that's in Pennsylvania. That's in Nazareth, Pennsylvania, Nazareth, Pennsylvania. Correct. Yes. And you can see the different badges. Okay. You can tell you talked about lineage. You can see, the original badge that has Farmingdale, New York. Then there's another badge that mentions, uh, it says Farmingdale. And then underneath it will say, uh, Project CF Martin Organization. And then there's a kind of the, the copy of the, uh, the reverse or 
kind of almost like the Gretsch stop sign badge where you have uh, uh, an up and down facing logo. So there's, there's these different generation of badges that happened over the time. Mm, okay. And then, you know, that's all sort of behind the scenes publicly in the seventies, they're then competing with the beginning, you know, and the, the, the happening of, uh, Japanese brands coming in more, which kind of went seventies into the eighties. So the, the market is getting, a little more strange with it's not just Ludwig and Rogers and Gretsch anymore. There's, there's even more competition. Um, right. And like I said earlier, Pearl is making fiberglass drums. That was one thing Bobby told me in Technicolor the, they were producing and some of the people at Pearl asked if they could come over and take a look at the facility. Hmm. Well, lo and behold, shortly after that, they come up with fiberglass product, hmm. man. And so, and companies tend to kind of do that, you know, we, yeah. there's, I could tell you all kinds of stories just at the trade shows when we were exhibiting of kind of things where people are scoping stuff out, what we were doing at that time. And I mean, taking notes and pulling out the microscope, all kinds of weird stuff. So, uh, I, I, that's, that's just the nature of the industry. Yeah. I heard the same thing. Uh, Jim Moritz, who runs Chicago Drum, his dad worked at Slingerland. He would do stuff at Slingerland over the summer. He said that um, that his dad mentioned that there would be uh, people from Japan who would come over and get, you know, yes, yes they would get into the Slingerland factory and take pictures. Yes. And, and then what do you know? Boom, they're making all the MIJ kits that look literally identical to Slingerland. Yes. At a distance, I've got one of the, um, I think it's an Apollo kit. At a distance, it looks like a Slayer kit. Yes, so. yes, they pretty much they pretty much just copied the tension casing almost verbatim, yeah. you know, and and that kind of stuff happens. I mean, that's reality, and and yeah, I'm, I have customers bring them in the store. And first, you have to do a double take, then you look inside the shell and see with the layup and mahogany with the center band and so forth, and you know, oh, okay, this is a Japanese thing, you know, yeah, yeah. of Which, that era. I think for there's so many. I mean, now. Way after the fact, I think, you know, people can look at it and go, those are really cool drums. I like the Japanese drums. I think it's they're they're They obviously gave all the companies over here in America a run for their money, but they really are neat drums with a lot of cool finishes. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Some of those, of those retro finishes are super hip, you yeah. know? Yeah. That's great. All right. So h- how was it with Martin, you know, through the 70s? What was it? What was the well, it was, it was that? Yeah, I, 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 it was in decline. As far as fives was concerned, mm-hmm. and uh, just a kind of somewhat funny little story. I opened my store in 1979. Well, I didn't have any drums because I wasn't a dealer for anybody at that time. Well, I contacted Martin because they had fives, and this is at the tail end of fives. And the very first professional set I brought in was literally a five set, five piece. At that time, and this was 1979, they only had two colors remaining, Hmm. white and black. In a five piece, 22, 12, 13, 16 configuration with the snare drum. And that's all they offered at that time. And that was literally the first, because before that, I put my own drum sets that I owned on the floor so I'd have something to show. They weren't for sale, <laughs> but I had to put something on the floor. Yeah. I was a drum shop, for God's sakes, you know? Uh, so I thought that was kind of an interesting little thing, how my first yeah. set I brought in was literally a fives kit. Mm. Wow. Kind of uh, serendipitous, serendipitous a little bit, isn't it? Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Well, I think, like we said before, a lot of companies were uh, in decline kind of in that that era. A lot of the quote-unquote heritage brands i mean you saw slingerland kind of starting to dec- decrease yep. then um yep. and things were just were yep. just changing which i'm sure martin was like like all the you hear about steinway and all these companies who buy these other drum companies like man it never seems to really work out that great you know yeah it's a tough it's tough i mean it is because you've got it takes a lot of money to produce a really quality instrument there's a lot of components uh, you have to realize that there's, there's, you gotta, you've got to have a pretty decent cash outlay to have the info inventory you need to even just to build. Yeah. And it's pretty labor intensive on top of that. So you, there's a lot in there. So manufacturing 
is is a is, is a pretty interesting little beast in itself <laughs> yeah oh i'm sure um yeah especially when you get into something that you don't really you know you're not a you're not a drum company um but so how long what was the time frame then of martin owning it then i guess unless there's any key things within you know then with players or anything what was their you know how did that come to an end well, they had they had it for about ten years. Oh yeah, okay. So, uh, uh, so around 1980, somewhere they're about. And here again, that was kind of funny. I brought in that set, and that was 1979. Well, probably somewhere within the next year or two, uh, the Quarter family from Huntsville, Alabama, came in, and according to Bobby, he had a handshake agreement with Frank Martin to buy the company back. Mm. Um, and he was very bitter about that because he considered Frank Martin a really, uh, a, a really nice guy and they were friends and all this kind of stuff. But he, he, f- he felt like he got stabbed in the back on the deal a little bit, yeah, but you know, I don't, I don't know the total details about it, but he did mention that to me that because Bobby's goal was to get the company back because he hated what he was seeing, what Martin was doing or not doing with the drums. Yeah, with his baby. You know, they really weren't putting anything into it at all. And, yeah. uh, um, uh, but, uh, so to speak, behind his back, um, he struck a deal with the Quarter family and they moved all the fixtures, tooling, machinery, so forth to Huntsville, Alabama. Uh, but the Fibes mark. The Fives logo was purchased by another individual because there were still Fives drumsticks, sim set, stay away, accessory type of things. And so this other gentleman bought the Fives mark. So it was split out from Fives, the factory, uh, because he had struck a deal with Martin to go to keep on distributing the sticks and accessories through Martin. Mm. So that basically split that up. So the Quarter family started Quarter Drums, um, and I met Don Quarter. I actually went down to Huntsville, and this goes back quite a few years. This is back when I was looking to purchase the factory from Darwin. Uh, and uh, uh, basically, they were in production for about 10 years as well. But they were trying to make stands. They were trying to do marching stuff. And, and here again, that's a tough market. You know, drum mm-hmm. sets are one thing. But, you know, try to compete in the marching percussion and, yeah. you know, ha- have all your various size bass drums and your, you know, your snare drums and so forth. That's a lot, you know. And plus, they were trying to make hardware, too. They were making hardware. And I think it was kind of eating them up. So, they only had it for about 10 years under quarter drums. Okay. And then, um, uh, uh, basically, what happened from there is… They decide they pull out uh, um, and and try to sell. Well, a guy named Sammy Darwin uh, from uh, Burnsville, Mississippi, and he's a ro- radio programmer. His handle was Rusty Walker, and he was. This is before Clear Channel and any of these big mega programmers came through. He was a pretty heavy hitting radio programmer nationwide. Was he himself a drummer? He was. A, he was a hobbyist. Let's okay. put it that way. Okay, as far as I could tell. Uh, but he bought the factory. He bought the factory from the quarters, Jeez. hook, line, and sinker, everything, <laughs> all the fixtures, tooling, machinery, a whole load of tubing, chrome tubing, assembly parts for stands, hi hats, uh, pedals, all this stuff. I mean, a huge amount of stuff. And he bought the whole thing, lock, stock, and barrel, hmm. and moved it from Huntsville, Alabama, to Burnsville, Mississippi. And so Darwin, Sammy, Sammy Darwin had it for about two years and he had, uh, he'd brought in Ken Austin. He's an industry veteran and, uh, Ken after about two years, and that's where John Cummings was working at Darwin. John had come from Ludwig and he's now the plant manager at Darwin. And basically after about two years and they were kind of floundering a little bit. I get a call from Ken Austin because he knew I was shopping around. I'd, I'd mentioned, I'd, I'd approach Phil Grant to try to buy Gretsch. Mm. 
and he was consult you know he was working with Fred Gretsch Jr. and which he was willing to sell the factory but not the Gretsch name which wouldn't do a stitch bit of good and mm-hmm. I got a hold of Joe Hibbs when he was Oshino because I wanted to buy the Camco name and they didn't want to do that either so they knew I was snooping around right I was kind of I was kind of looking and so anyway uh I had a good friend in the industry. I don't know if you know who Chuck Molinari is. I think I've heard the name. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Chuck was, oh my God. He, he was production manager at Camco for quite a while. Okay. Uh, up in Chicago, up in Illinois. And, uh, and Chuck, uh, went on to do Spectra sound, which was the bar team, the, the Mark trees as they call them. And he had percussion accessories and the Mark trees and everything. And Chick and I became very good friends, and we'd talk and chick chat and everything like that. And and uh, you know, and I would, he would I would sound off of him. He was like a walking textbook of everything drums. He's one of those guys. Fortunately, I was able to befriend him and Al Duffy too. That's another story into itself. Is Al Duffy? I don't know if you've ever heard that name before either. But Al worked at when I met him. He worked at Pearl, but he used to work at Frank Epolito's. Al. Uh, invented the chain of sprocket pedal. Yes, yes. For from, Elvin. Yep. From Jones. The 5000 and all that stuff. Uh, yeah, that all came from Al Duffy. He's yep. the one that invented that. And also the FF, uh, the free floater system for Pearl as well, because it was at Pearl that time where I met Al. Mm. But going back a little bit with back to uh, uh, Chuck Molinari, um, I get a call out of the blue because he knew I was looking and he knew I was talking to this person. I was talking to this person. And I was kind of beat in the bushes a little bit. And Chuck calls me out of the blue and he says, you need to give, you need to give Ken Austin a call. So what's going on? He says, um, I think this, uh, this Darwin thing's for sale. You might be interested in it. So I did it. I called Ken Austin because Sammy had entrusted Ken to try to sell the company. And so I started negotiating with Ken and he was, he was Sammy's, point man on this and we kind of went back and forth and everything like that and and i could tell that sam was very highly motivated he was he was definitely a fish out of water he had a slightest idea what to do yeah sure. and even john cummings at that time was pretty frustrated with what was going on and wasn't spending as much time there and flying back and forth to his home and so anyway so i ended up uh uh just basically going to Burnsville, Mississippi, and actually had contacted John Cummings and asked him if he would meet me there. And so we both flew into Memphis, and I had never met him before I'd talked to him on the phone, John Cummings. And so basically we met each other, kind of hit it off immediately, jumped in the car and drove down to Burnsville, Mississippi. Hmm. Because John knew the factory better than anybody. And he could explain to me the various machines, what was involved in the sale, so forth, everything like that. Yeah. Um, so basically, uh, we did a walkthrough, everything like that. And then basically then it was down to me and Sammy and he wanted, he wanted more money than I thought it was worth. And I knew he was kind of, it's kind of point where he just wanted to kind of get out from under it mm-hmm. because he was, he was, he was a big time radio programmer. He didn't need to, he didn't need the grief. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, drum company. <laughs> and, yeah. Right. Right. And you know, to me, it sounded all glorious, you know, until you get into the nuts and bolts of it and you go, Oh damn, this is a task. <laughs> yeah. and, you know what I mean? <laughs> and, uh, so in any case, uh, um, uh, we struck a deal. Well, simultaneously to that, uh, and part of, part of the deal was, uh, Ken Austin had located who owned the fives mark cause we're banding about names of a company mm-hmm. and there's this and that. I said, no, I said, it has to be fives or it won't work. So part of the freaky thing about it for me personally was actually the acquisition of the factory from Darwin happened prior to the acquisition of the Fives trademark and logo. Uh, hmm. They both happened within the same month, which wow. was what uh, December of 94. Um, and that's how I rebirthed the company. Hmm. 
Well, you're so right. You can't have one without the other. You can't like. Well, yeah, because it's kind of like the quarter thing and the Darwin thing. It's like because everybody said, "Oh, that's what that's what the fives used to be. That's the old fives." Thing. Yeah, that's where that was. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because of the highly recognizable, the diamond lugs, just the you know the spurs, the whole bit. I mean, it, it had that kind of history to it at yeah. that time, even where where it, that's what is recognized. So, yeah. to me, in my mind, nothing else would work. In other words, if I was going to get this company, it had to be fives. I wanted to rebirth fives. Hmm. Which is, it's good that it got in the hands of someone who actually, you know, not that those other guys didn't care, but that it, that someone wants to put it back all together. Um, yeah. So yeah. that was what, like 1994-ish? Yes. And we moved, we used two 18-wheelers, stuffed to the gills. I mean, we worked day and night, mud, sludge. Just dirt, filth, rolled up our sleeves. John and I, we just started packing everything up. And at 4 o'clock in the morning on December 7th, closed the door on the 18-wheelers and started driving down here to Austin. Wow. Exhausted. Yeah. Absolutely frigging <laughs> exhausted. I mean, it was about five days of the most intense physical labor work you could imagine. God, that's so it much It was just stuff. unbelievable. I, I mean, I couldn't, it's hard to even express what we went through just to get it done. Yeah. And so anyway, that's, <laughs> that's kind of, that's kind of the short story on it all. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Wow. But all right. So then you, you then started creating drums, correct? Yeah. What we did is we got, we had to set up obviously. So this was uh, what, December 94. Uh, the first order of business is obviously we found a place, uh, started setting up, had to do a little bit of remodel on the building, had to get some three-phase electrical in, uh, so forth, to run these machines because there's a full machine shop, full wood shop, because uh, a lot of parts are made in-house. Um, and so it was a matter of putting all that together. So uh, hired a few workers, uh, got it all put together. And, uh, um, so by the time we actually went to the show, the NAM show, the winter NAM show, this kind of running joke that Ken Austin did is, is we didn't have any, we didn't have any product yet, but I was so bold and brazen about the deal. I went ahead and <laughs> rented a booth anyway, and we <laughs> went out there with director's chairs that had the five logo on the back and a big nice. oak table. And we're just sitting around greeting everybody. This is yet to come. This is coming around the corner. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> but everyone would be excited. Everyone would be like, whoa. I mean, that, that gets some buzz. and Well, it did. It did. It, would, it was kind of a precursor to coming out. So literally by the uh, Nashville show uh, in July, I think it was July at that time, the summer show, as we call it, uh, we exhibited and displayed the first set we had completed that was, uh, it was a ruby red kit. And uh, that's, that's what we showed at the first show in Nashville. I've heard, I've never played one myself personally, but I've heard that people really like the, as they call them, the Austin era um, fives. So I think you've, you know, you've carried the brand on well. Did you, so obviously same manufacturing type. I mean, you're still, it's fiberglass. It's um, all that same good stuff. Well, the, the fiberglass is on the snare drums only. Okay. Uh, uh, the rest were, were wood shells. And then we started doing the crystallite shortly thereafter because everybody's going well what about the crystallites what about you know it's like you start doing one thing and everybody starts saying, well what are you going to do this when are you going to do that well yeah. there you go yeah. you know so that was kind of the next wave but we were doing fiberglass snare drums and wood and complete wood sets too mm. and oh. uh um but because the molds for the tom floor tom and bass drum molds were not in good enough shape and not worth even, you know, using. Sure. And, and matter of fact, when I did the, the molds had already gone uh, down to Florida, I believe, or something, even before Quarter even got a hold of it because they just, they were in such disrepair that they weren't worth carting around, you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. Interesting. Now, um, it's 2021 now. Are you, I mean, I'm sure things have probably slowed down a little bit and there's been COVID and all this stuff. I'm not exactly sure. When was the last 
you know, batch of fives, drums created, can people still order them today or, or how does uh, No, because I'm not in production. That's another, I could probably go on for three hours. I'd burn your ears up on stuff, <laughs> but basically, um, um, uh, our last production was, uh, in the first quarter of Oh seven. Okay. Okay. And, uh, uh, that was, that was when we stopped production and, what happened is I ended up selling, we had moved the factory once from the original location. And, uh, uh, so we moved to where my drum shop used to be and I moved my store across the street. So we had to go in and do remodel, get the electrical drops, do all these things to get that building prepped so we could move the factory. Uh, the landlord at the original place we had moved to was getting kind of squirrely and I was trying to, trying to swing a deal so we could, do an owner finance, anything, so I could retain that property. He wasn't having it, and the writing was on the wall. I better get the hell out of here mm -hmm. because I've got, I'm have got. i sitting on all this machinery and equipment, and pretty soon they're going to tell me to get out and give me 30 days or whatever. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah sure. So uh, so that's when I made the move. And, um, um, and, and so I moved, I moved just, well, just literally about three blocks away from where the original factory was in Austin, because that's where my store is located. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. And, Jeez. Yeah. Well, what a amazing um, journey of fives. And, you know, I never take for granted that maybe people aren't as, you know, they're newer to the drums and they hadn't heard of fives because it's not a household name like Ludwig or uh, to drummers, to re to most drummers, it is a household name, but you know what I mean, where it's a little oh, more, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, you yeah. know, specific of a brand. So it's really cool to get this. And, uh, and, and, you know, it's been on my, my list for a long time. Um, so I'm just super pumped to have you on here to share the story now. Oh, yeah. Tommy, if you have some extra, you know, an extra 10 minutes or so, I would love to do our bonus episode this week, uh, which people pay a little extra and they can uh, join on Patreon and they get them. I'd like to talk to you for someone, uh, for someone who's owned a drum shop for so long about what that's been like and the ups and downs. And there's some younger guys now and girls who want to start a shop. So maybe you can give some advice on that. Um, I think that'd be, that'd be neat if we can, after we finish this episode, if you can share some of your, uh, your drum shop knowledge, if that's okay. Oh well, yeah, of course. Of course. I, I'm yeah, that's no problem at all. Okay. Well, on that note, um, let's just uh close it out there and i want to again thank eric hughes um for uh ech eric c hughes i should say for um kind of recommending you eric's an awesome drummer uh a texan as your such as yourself and uh kind of got us connected so tommy thank you so much for being here uh before we go do you want to tell people where they can find your shop online so they can check out your inventory and all that good stuff yeah, that's actually, uh, I, the, my website is basically identity website that needs to be retooled. So that, that really, it is Tommy's drum .com, uh, as far as that goes, but cool. the best thing to do is do it the old fashioned way and give us a call. Sounds good. <laughs> Perfect. All right, Tommy. Well, uh, thanks for being here. And if anyone wants to check out the Patreon bonus episode, you can go to drumhistorypodcast.com and there's a Patreon link there and you can join up and get these bonus episodes. So, Tommy, thank you for being here. Thank you so much for having me. Appreciate it. If you like this podcast, find me on social media at Drum History and please share, rate, and leave a review. And let me know topics that you would like to learn about in the future. Until next time, keep on learning.